Princeton University's Keller Center, educating leaders for a technology-driven society. Actually, that's a great. Thank you for being customers. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm too good of a customer. <laughs> Thank you, Vince. Uh, <laughs> my pleasure. Uh, Jeff is a, a Princeton graduate, summa cum laude, 1989, uh, from chemical engineering. Uh, Any chemies? We didn't yeah, ask about chemicals. All right. Uh, he also received a master's degree in chemical engineering and an MBA from another institution in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, MIT. Uh, in a program there called Leaders for Manufacturing, and there he focused on total quality and process improvement techniques, which uh, certainly are evident in Amazon's uh, uh, products. Uh, before joining Amazon, Jeff has held a number of other uh, corporate leadership positions, including as vice president and general manager of the pharmaceutical fine chemicals uh, division of Allied Signal, which is now part of Honeywell. Uh, where he was responsible for a $200 million global business, uh, probably smaller than Amazon's global business today. Uh, he was already well known, of course, for his leadership skills in this role when he joined Amazon in 1999, first as vice president for and general manager for operations. Uh, a few years later, he became senior vice president. Uh, in addition to a busy corporate and also family life, uh, Jeff is a, a great uh, Princeton alum. Uh, he volunteers uh, in many ways for Princeton, in particular as a member of our Engineering Leadership Council, uh, which is a group of very talented individuals uh, who give us very sage advice about our strategic directions. Uh, this group has been a big help to me, and I I'm very grateful to them. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce another member of the Leadership Council, Andy Tung, uh, who is sitting there. Uh, the Leadership Council is actually meeting this week, so the next two days, uh, uh, Jeff and Andy and I will be uh, spending a lot more time together. Uh, so especially given the scope and complexity of the leadership uh, uh, thing, issues that Jeff has had to face, uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say today, and particularly uh, in view of the topic of his top talk, which is tough choices, leadership is all about the long run. So Jeff, thank you very much for being here, and please join me. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hopefully, I don't need this one. Is, uh, is it on? You can hear me? Okay, it's, it's okay. It'll be all right. Um, it's quite an honor to have the oppor opportunity to address this kind of community about the subject of leadership. Uh, I joined Prince's, Princeton's CEASE uh, Advisory Council because I've long believed that Princeton's very special mix of fundamental science, engineering, and service for all nations is precisely what's necessary to lead in this interconnected technological world. One of the key inspirations behind my decision to attend MIT's Leadership Manufacturing Program in 1991 was a book by William Baumel, who was teaching at Princeton at the time, uh, called Productivity in American Leadership, The Long View. The prospect for declining standard of living in this country and other Western democracies due to the widening at that time productivity gap between Asia in particular and uh, the US and Europe scared me thoroughly. I've spent the last 16 years in the middle of operating businesses, including Amazon.com, with lots of plants, lots of people, and long run choices. Today I'd like to share some of my observations. So I'm required to use this chart during each pitch I make regarding Amazon. 
Uh, sometimes the topic of a talk doesn't seem to fit with the legalese. Given the title of this talk, you can see that the first sentence actually is relevant, so my general counsel was very pleased that the slide was relevant. Tough choices. Leadership is all about the long run. Before I dive in, I need to set some context by answering some basic questions the title of this talk evokes. First, leading what? How long is the long run? What choices? So let's start with leading what? This talk may apply to managing a Little League baseball team, running a small family business or a very large family business, setting up a startup company, running a computer science department, or leading a small local charity. Leaders of such organizations certainly worry about the long run, and they make tough choices every day. But nearly all competent leaders at this level can see the boundaries of their universe clearly. They don't need to have layers of middle managers to help with the details of decision making or to carry out the resulting plans. Their balance sheets consist of a small collection of people, a worthy cause, even winning the Little League trophy counts, and whatever capital the founder can scrape together, usually by sheer force of personal conviction. In short, the enterprise is defined by the dreams of the leader. This talk, and most especially the kinds of choices I want to talk with you about today, apply much more to very large organizations, which due to sheer size alone require very large leadership jobs. These are jobs where the leader can have enormous impact, especially given the volume of resources already amassed, but where the leader can't even know the names of everyone on their team. You don't know their kids, you don't know their passions or their long-run motivations. Sometimes you believe for a moment that you see clearly the boundaries of your influence as a leader or even of the entire firm, but the myriad management tasks in your inbox, some of us are better at managing our inbox than others, Vince is notorious for processing thousands of emails a day, uh, force you to move on and whatever clarity in the boundaries you thought you had uh, um, quickly fade. There are several ways to define the scale. We could talk about the economic value of the assets owned by the organization. We could focus on the geographic scope of the organization how many countries or continents are influenced by the organization and its leaders. I prefer to think about scale in terms of the number of people led. This is a very simple way to look at it, uh, but mostly because m whatever choices the leader makes in an organization with large headcount persist only if people at different levels follow. So I found that I can know a team of around 10 people really well. Sometimes 15 is okay. Occasionally confluence of personality challenges requires me to lower this threshold to seven. But this size, I can truly treat as an extension of my own hands and mind. Now, if the basic relationship holds for most leaders, organizations will begin to hire a second layer, especially when repeatable tasks um, require Frederick Taylor-style division of labor, sometime soon after the 11th person is hired. Building an organ this way, there's a very important choice made on average at about 100 people, or 110. That's to add a third layer. I'm certain that I can't know everything about 100 people, but if the team of 10 that's a direct extension of my hands and mind do, then every one of the 100 folks, assuming we're all at 10 to 1, can be touched directly by me. When we add the third layer, certain tasks of leadership get much harder, and I contend these are about the long run. But I can be sure until 1,000 people that the extension of my mind and hands is directly communicating to the layer who is setting the tone with the lowest organizational layer, no more at 1,000. The introduction of a fourth management layer means that there's translation between the layers at levels three and four. This translation of principles is one, day large or one way large organizations start to break down. To get an idea of the scale of the organizations on which I'll focus, let's see who's on the list in government, academia, and industry. The slide shows the number of employees in the payroll for entities around 1,000 people, and then one giant one for the US government. George Bush has a large role. Uh, I'm sure that whoever runs the city of Fremont, the city of Inglewood, the city of Reno, have to deal with just the sort of translation of principles that can handicap a large organization. In education, there are some very large universities, of course, but even the smaller colleges have substantial staff. The leadership of Bradley University deals with some of the same organizational risk as the mayor of Reno. Finally, in business, the threshold of 1,000 is not reserved for just the very largest companies. YMCA, Barclays American, and Bonefish Grill, actually, are there Bonefish Grills on the East Coast? This must be a, I, I saw one in Seattle the other day, so I was pleased that I actually knew what it was. Um, they're all, they all are exposed to the danger of the fifth layer, never truly understanding the principles espou espoused by the first. So the short answer to leading what is organizations of a thousand or more people. 
What is the long run? We're unlikely to argue that choices about tomorrow are, long, are short run. Clearly choices that affect outcomes 100 years from now are long run, I hope. Let's think for a moment about the personal incentives impacting the leaders who make tough choices. In business, such incentives usually fall into economic self-interest, coupled with some measure of non-economic utility that comes from things like the emotional satisfaction of a job well done or a sense of purpose that comes with changing the world. I'll simply assert that a definition of short run is that time when the leader is both in control and the outcomes of his or her choices are realized or nearly certain. This is the time when choices are linked to self-interest and the rewards sought are delivered. That leaves the long run defined then as that time frame which is beyond the longest the leader could expect to hold a particular position. In other words, if most of the positive outcomes of a choice are expected to occur after the leader is no longer in power, the time frame is the long run. For most careers, this implies an epoch of between five years and a generation. So what choices will we talk about? Here are some examples of short-run choices leaders of large organizations make every day. Should I close one plant and move it to China? Should I fire an underperforming employee? Should I sell a widget for $20 or $30? Should I invest in a project with typically volatile returns, certain investment, but in an area where the firm has lots of history and lots of expertise? I'll throw in one that isn't in the business realm but may be relevant in this room, which is should I grant a student an A or a B? certainly matters for the profitability of the student, perhaps, in the long run. I do not believe for a second that many of these choices are emotionally easy to make. As a leader, I've had to close plants, fire employees, and make tough financial trade-offs. It's very hard to be the person ultimately responsible for a decision that causes pain to colleagues and a community. But the right choice for a profit-maximizing firm, operating within the constraints of all applicable laws and regulations, is usually quite clear. Leaders of large organizations agonize over myriad such decisions daily. They don't always get them right, but they can be analyzed through time-tested financial and behavioral frameworks. The work of making these decisions is certainly tough, but usually with the right amount of analysis, the choices are straightforward. There are large leadership tasks, by the way, that are very short-term, saving lives in the hours after a natural disaster, for example. While these tasks require a Herculean effort, the choice to begin them for those in government and industry responsible for protecting human life is nearly always an easy one. There are lots of things about the pursuit of, whoops, sorry about that. There are lots of things about the pursuit of long-term value that are hard on leaders. Examples include travel, being always on, and trying to envision the future. I can't imagine having Condoleezza Rice's job as an example, um, or Colin Powell when he was, he was doing it. Just the sheer uh, the, the sheer emotional and physical energy required to do that kind of travel is, is extraordinary. But I found that the hardest thing to do as a leader is to make the right long-term choices. There are a number of reasons why this is so. The simplest is that you won't find out whether you were right or wrong for a very long time. But there are other reasons it's hard. Often stakeholders, including employees and investors, have different time frames than a thoughtful leader. They'll question your judgment and they can sap your energy. Preparing for the future can mean present sacrifice and many leaders are not willing to accept this trade-off. The hardest long-run choices, I think, fall into these two classes, very simply. First, allocating resources, investing, to be prepared for the future when there is little short-term return. Here the risk, what is hard, is predicting the set of outcomes, which can be extremely uncertain. And the investment can be simplified. I assume that the microeconomic model taught at Princeton is still K and L for the two-factor uh, microeconomic model, so capital and labor are the, the two resources to be invested. The second is a behavioral choice made by leaders, to be consistent. To maintain the discipline of action and word, especially during hard times, to stay true to core principles. For this class, the external environment can be considered constant. Risk is personal and organizational laziness. We'll discuss three examples, all from the realm of large scale and very long time frame in more detail, which I hope will reveal these leadership challenges more clearly. Let's flip the order of the classes, these two classes though, and start with consistency. MIT's, sorry, Ed, Ed is the most concise on this particular subject, so I'll use it, his, his quote. In 1984, observed that organizational, quote, organizational culture is the pattern of basic assumptions that a given group has invented, discovered, or developed in learning to cope with its problems of external adaptation and internal integration, and that have worked well enough to be considered valid and therefore to be taught to new members as the correct way to perceive, think, and feel in relation to these problems. He goes on to describe several layers of analysis of culture, including visible artifacts, which are the constructed environment of the organization, its architecture, technology, office layout, manner of dress, 
visible or audible pattern, behavioral patterns. This level of analysis is tricky because the data are easy to obtain but hard to interpret. And we'll share some things about that in a moment. Values that govern behavior is another level. They can reveal why members behave the way they do, but values are very hard to observe directly. To really understand a culture and to ascertain more completely the group's values, and these are Ed's words, uh, and overt behavior, it's imperative to delve into the underlying assumptions, which are typically unconscious, but which actually determine how group members perceive, think, and feel. Because of the human need for order and consistency, assumptions become patterned into what may be termed cultural paradigms. I'm not sure that Ed coined this term in 1984 as a ways back, so this is overused now. It wasn't in 1984. Um, and these things tie together the basic assumptions about humankind, nature, and activities. If human beings do indeed have a cognitive need for order and consistency, one can then assume that all groups will eventually evolve sets of assumptions that are compatible and consistent. Ed's eloquence stops. No, this is me. The power of culture is, I think, nearly self-evident. With our definition of scale, more than 1,000 people, the importance of paradigms in guiding behavior at the bottom of the organization and at every layer between the bottom and the top can't be, under, can't be overestimated. Underestimated, sorry. But building or changing patterns is much tougher than creating visible artifacts. Some leaders take the easy way out. Perhaps they focus on the work environment exclusively. Should we be East Coast stodgy? Now, this plays well on the West Coast. We'll have to see if you, how you feel, though. With dark wood paneled boardrooms, expensive office real estate, coat and tie everywhere, hushed conversations. <laughs> I did, that's not Frank, by the way. <laughs> or perhaps West Coast startup hip with game rooms, Communication only by email and SMS, bean bags, free food, and a work day that never ends. <laughs> These are some Amazonians. Some hire only people, I'll leave you with Kim Rackmiller in the middle, who's a, an Amazon VP, a wonderful woman. Some hire only people with certain backgrounds, graduates of only the Ivy League, graduates of anything but the Ivy League. MBAs, no MBAs. When I started at Amazon, there was a gentleman who worked with me who had an MBA with a red circle around it and a line through it on his wall. Um, computer scientists who have worked in several startups, former strategy consultants. The problem for me is that I have lots of examples of large organizations which have a very different culture from the one you'd expect based on the artifacts alone. I do agree with Professor Shine that patterns of assumptions are most powerful in defining culture. Such cultural paradigms are very hard to build because they require internal compatibility and consistency in decisions, actions, and communication. So let's dive most deeply into an example where the long-term objective is clear, but the choice as to how to get there is not. The example is workplace safety, specifically creating a culture of safety. The reason a leader would do this, especially in an industry or laboratory environment where there may be myriad potential hazards, and this I think is as pertinent now, by the way, as it was 25 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. There are workplace dangers in every industry, including high tech. Um, and as you know, in, in the business that I'm in now at, at Amazon, uh, you'll see in a moment the statistics, the warehousing and, and logistics industry is among the worst. Um, so this is not confined to 1900. Um, why would you do this? The, it's a very simple value. The leader truly cares about his or her employees, and they don't want anyone to get hurt. The outcomes prized by the leader include low injury rates, high morale and trust with the workforce, community recognition, and even lower rates for workplace, on a, workplace insurance. So just several weeks ago, as I was actually preparing this talk, um, we were presented with data from the U.S. Chemical Safety Board on why senior leaders need to worry about safety today. This one concerns the explosion at the BP facility in Texas. This is one of several very high-profile examples over the last few decades of where safety cultures have broken down to catastrophic effect. Take a second to, uh, to read these. Some of you in the audience weren't born, and this is painful, but who was not born in 1984? Uh, okay. Uh, when one of the worst industrial disasters in history occurred. I remember this December vividly as I was firmly set by then on becoming a chemical engineer. I was shocked to learn what my future profession had let happen. The words on this page were written 20 years later and show the gigantic human impact in India 
and lingering corporate problems here in the U.S. The one that uh, I find particularly tough, and this is, again is the, is the quote, far from helping to alleviate the sufferings of the survivors, Union Carbide tried to absolve its liabilities by selling its assets. So there's, this, there's, there's a whole assumption of, of how the corporate team behaved even after the, the accident here. Um, clearly, the Union Carbide safety culture in 1984 had significant flaws. What choices can leaders make to avoid this long-run risk? This is dense, and I'm not going to ask you to just you can glance at it. Uh, from, this is from the OSHA website. Working with industry and labor, OSHA created the Voluntary Protection Program in 1982, so two years before the Bhopal disaster, to recognize and partner with work sites that implement exemplary systems to manage worker safety and health. The managers, employees, and any authorized employee representatives at these volunta sites voluntarily implement comprehensive safety programs. They go well beyond basic compliance with OSHA. Using one set of, that's one of the reasons they're hard, using one set of flexible performance-based criteria, this VPP process emphasizes management accountability for worker safety and health, continual identification of hazards and elimination of them, and active involvement of employees in their own protection. VPP places significant reliance on the cooperation and trust inherent in partnership. Companies and individual sites choosing to apply for VPP show their commitment to effective worker pr participation by inviting a government regulator into the workplace. In return, OSHA removes them from programmed inspection lists and does not issue them citations for standards violations that are promptly corrected. The next several slides detail this program um, and also provide a clear definition, I think, of a strong safety-oriented culture that's long-term. I'll read a few of them to you to, get, to give you a flavor of how comprehensive and hard they are to do in practice. So those were some of the first ones. Um, a managerial commitment to worker safety and health protection, top site management's personal involvement, written safety and health management system, necessary resources to meet the responsibilities. You cannot just commit words. You must commit dollars, uh, labor, and capital. At least three ways employees are meaningfully involved in the activities and decision-making that impact their safety and health. There are annual safety and health management system evaluations on each element in VPP in a narrative format where there's no collective bargaining written assurance by management that employees understand and support VPP participation. Baseline hazard analysis identifies and documents common hazards associated with the site. There's also requirements for sampling plans for, uh, for chemical sites. Documentation of these hazards. Hazard analysis of significant changes. So anytime you change a particular process that's dangerous, you have to document it in a very rigorous way. <laughs> There's a requirement for, uh, for hazard prevention and control. And, and this, in particular, is where engineering can have a huge impact. Um, an effective system for eliminating or controlling hazards. So it's one thing to identify them. It's another to engineer processes that eliminate the risk uh, to human life and human injury. This system emphasizes engineering solutions that provide reliable and effective protection. It may also utilize, in preferred order, administrative controls that limit daily exposure, such as job rotation, it's increasingly important in um, repetitive stress. Work practice controls such as rules and work practices that govern how workers do a job safely and healthfully, and personal protective equipment. And an enormous commitment to employee training at all levels. While some of the outcomes of a great safety program are hard to quantify, injury rates are not. The difference between industries and between the best and worst within particular industries is huge. From the very best companies in the chemical industry, where lost time incident rates are often below 0.3, and that's three people or 0.3 people out of 100 injured on average over the course of a year. So it's per 200,000 work hours. To the average manufacturing company at 3.5. So 3.5 out of 100 people in the average manufacturing company get hurt badly enough to report the incident um, in the course of a year. And from financial services, where people still get hurt in office incidents, slipping on coffee spills, um, having drawers pulled out and tripping. Um, actually, there's some very severe injuries that occur, uh, falls and, and head injuries from these things. Um, to the worst industry of all, uh, transportation and warehousing at nearly five. Amazon is well below this, by the way. It, it, it was not uh, in 1999. It is now. There are too many employees out of 100 who get injured seriously enough to miss work each year across industries. Such inju inju injuries are not confined to very large corporate behemoths. In fact, this data shows that the biggest problems occur under the weight of the leadership challenges I talked about up front. 
just after the addition of the third layer of management and continuing all the way to a thousand employee level. There is a leader, where there is a leader in his or her 10 reports, safety performance is strikingly better. Hands and, hands and eyes, hands and mind. Some of this must be due to the direct principled interaction between the leader and all employees. As the VPP star status requirements illustrate, the set of leadership tasks required to build a true safety culture is daunting. If our objectives are not real cultural change, leading to a lasting long run outcome, there may be an easier way for leaders to meet their goals over the fir first few years of a safety effort. Operations and business leaders can simply take the approach that what gets measured gets done. It's simple, but it's not complete. They can set tough objectives for injury rates for every plant and then simply fire the plant managers who miss, reward and recognize those who make the numbers. These may be important elements of the safety program, measurement and accountability, but they, they are, as we have seen, by no means comprehensive. After several years of management communication focused mostly on injury rates, a clear hierarchy of operating sites will emerge in such a company. Some plants will not work very hard to change and miss by a mile. The problems will be very obvious and leadership changes will be necessary. Other plants will have great years. Some may even have no injuries at all, measured in injuries. But what about the plants that have injuries where there's extenuating circumstances? Perhaps there's a poorly designed process by the central engineering team who has nothing to do with the plant or the plant manager. What about a freak ice storm that leads to hazardous walkways in a region unused to cold temperatures? This happened to me in a plant in Virginia. What if there are contractors who don't follow your own rules? What if we see repeated poor judgment calls by tired employees with no personal incentive to be careful? I contend the easy choice is to focus solely on the accident rates. This will lead to the worst possible outcome. Fear in the plant leader, fear in the area manager, fear in the hourly worker. Not of getting hurt necessarily, but of losing their job as a result of being included in the statistic. The res this results in the obvious human hourly response, or our human response in hourly workers, attempts to hide injury. The sad thing in these results is that everyone in the organization knows this is happening. So it pervades the way employees in the community think about the company. In the end, a culture has been created a culture with inconsistency between stated values and management behavior. It will certainly not be the best one for the long run. The tough choice for the leader here is to put together a comprehensive approach to monitor progress and make good judgments along the way. To commit to the programs outlined by OSHA and others, even when the requirements of personal energy are extraordinary. The leader certainly needs to set tough objectives and make the right choices on who to hire and fire, but there is more to complete success. If the leader is not a domain expert, he or she must find one because in this space, understanding of tools, process, and engineering matter. Leaders need to walk the talk in every communication and in every meeting. They need to audit real process changes in addition to injury rate statistics so that they can understand how managers are achieving their numbers. In fact, this process audit leads to the very hardest choices in evaluating managers. Jack Welsh often describes three types of leaders. Mark, this will be old hat for you, sorry. Um, Mark and I worked together for years at Allied Signal under Larry Bossidy, who uh, used many of the same concepts that, uh, that Jack used the GE. Uh, so the three types of managers, those who make their numbers with the right behavior, those who miss their numbers but do it the right way, and those who make the numbers the wrong way. For most leaders, it's easy to deal with the first group. You promote them. They make their numbers the right way. It's those who consistently behave the right way but occasionally miss their numbers who deserve the energy required to coach them to success. Well, there are special times, turnarounds that are short run as an example, when it's desirable to have managers who leave scorched earth behind. The damage caused by Welsh's third type, right, right results, wrong behavior, can be crippling to a culture. The hard choice is to truly audit the performance and behaviors of the most successful managers by the numbers to make certain that they are reinforcing the right culture. So from leadership choice where the risk is inconsistency, this is the safety example, leading to poor long run performance, Let's dive into an example of the set of leadership choices that is simply about how much personal and firm resource, capital and labor, to allocate to be prepared for the long run. Let's focus on one key element of the balance sheet in terms of resource allocation, property, plant and equipment, PP&E. This represents a huge investment for firms that do any kind of physical manufacturing, and even some firms that don't physically manufacture like Amazon. So GM has $39 billion on their balance sheet in PPE, Intel has $18 billion, Cisco, which outsources a lot of manufacturing, has $3.5 billion, and Amazon has, um, has managed to amass $457 million of property, plant, and equipment in 30 physical locations around the world. 
Senior leadership is usually involved in allocating these huge sums of capital and the labor that's associated with them as the firm selects the number of plants and their location. Sometimes the network topology that results deserves review and plants are considered for closure. So closing a plant seems like a very hard leadership choice given the number of lives impacted. Actually, for the short run, the decision itself is usually quite straightforward for any one plant. You ask some, sim some simple questions. What are our fixed and variable costs? How do they compare with our alternatives? How do they compare with our competitors' situation? How much future investment do we expect to need to maintain our current performance? How much growth do we see in the markets for our goods? What contracts or laws restrict changes in employment or investment levels? The questions are awfully susceptible to analysis. The leader in a publicly traded corporation has the obligation, after compliance with law, to make the decision that's in the best interest of the share owners. Since the share owners' interests in the company are economic, this, the results of the analysis we just talked about guide the choice, these questions. The moment the economic choice is made, good leaders turn all of their attention and energy to the human beings who are impacted by their decision. Taking care of people is not a hard choice, but it can be mentally, emotionally, and physically exhausting for the leader. Now, plants close all the time. Such closures are part of the ebb and flow of macroeconomic trends and microeconomic choices. They're painful for the people and communities involved, but firms, uh, give you too early of a look, firms with good managers typically benefit from the change while committing firm resources to ease the pain. If as many plants were closing as opening in any one country over the course of years, there may be nothing to worry about. However, that is not what has been happening in the U.S. or in much of Western Europe as plants have closed and jobs have moved to Asia ultimately to China, ultimately for now to China. This longer-term macroeconomic trend is the result of individual short-term microeconomic decisions, and it has huge potential implications, especially on the standard of living for each country participating in world trade. I don't like to see high-paying manufacturing jobs move offshore, but I understand the economic drivers and prefer this outcome over the one we'd see with limited global trade. I'm certain that when wages equalize, and they will eventually, things will again be made in the U.S., my question is, who will be making them? The question goes right to the heart of the vitality of firms headquartered in America and Western Europe. The next part of this talk is written from the perspective of an American citizen living in America with the assumption that national borders will remain important and fixed and that there will be winners and losers in the global economy. The point of view could be shifted to any nation with, a nation with similar implications for its citizens. So just how many manufacturing or assembly plants are there in the U.S.? Turns out there are many, over 350,000 to be exact. Most of these are very small, with less than 100 people. But there are over 30,000 plants with more than 100 employees that represent over 55% of the manufacturing employment in the U.S. Leaders of large organizations look at the viability of these plants every day, one by one, and the statistics are not encouraging. More plants are closing than opening in the last 10 years in the U.S., but why? One key reason is that individual firms are maximizing their profit by closing plants one by one and moving to low-wage countries. With the average U.S. wage at $23 in 2005, moves to Mexico, China, and India just make good economic sense. Once these countries struggled to build processes and equipment that could compete with the U.S. or EU on quality, no more. The quality of consumer electronics coming out of Selectron's plants in China often exceed the quality of their U.S. and EU counterparts. Hand tools like drills and saws made in China and once assigned cheap private label brands command most of the market now. These are countless examples, there are countless examples in nearly every country of these moves. In each case, the decision by individual firms for an individual plant makes sense. The aggregate effect of these choices, which I've argued for firms as a short-run choice, is a long-run outcome which should make Amer Americans very nervous. Our manufacturing employment has fallen since the mid-1990s and there is no economic barrier on the horizon to slow this trend. While wages in factories on the east coast of China may rise, there seems to be a never-ending pool of agrarian labor ready to take on more factory work. When this labor supply runs out, and even before it does, there are plenty of workers around the world with far less wealth than their American and European counterparts who will be willing to do manufacturing work at a much lower wage. So what, you may say, there are great information-based and services jobs to take the place of these lost high-wage jobs here. It's true for those with an education. But with our high schools producing fewer graduates with acceptable math and science skills and the increasing ability of information-based tasks to be ported to places like India, even these jobs are at risk. For college-educated educated Americans and Europeans, the job market should still look good. 
But for anyone else who wants a solidly middle-class lifestyle with good long-term benefits, the outlook is scary. In fact, most assembly jobs in the U.S. pay two to six times the minimum wage. They offer the best medical, dental, and vision care for workers with less education than a college degree. If these trends continue, government will clearly have some income redistribution to do to keep uneducated Americans healthy and reasonably happy. But for how long? Will the jobs ever come back? I actually think they will, and for the same reasons that Honda and Toyota are building plants here in the U.S. At some point in the future, transportation costs, we'll have some good discussions over the next three days, I think, transportation costs will dominate labor costs for manufactured products that weigh more than a few ounces. Assuming the U.S. remains a huge consumer market, it will only make sense to begin to manufacture again heavily in the U.S. This slide shows some basic math on when that might be. I've taken 2003 wage rates, used 2009 projections to get an annual growth rate. This is very simple math, uh, easily um, argued against. Uh, with simple compounding, you can see the year in which each country may catch the wages of the U.S. Now, there are lots of problems with this model, myriad problems. Certainly, the wage rates will vary by country. I haven't taken into account productivity at all. Jobs will move before wages become equal, so that has a dampening effect. Governments may create incentives that partially offset the effect of lower wages or accentuates it. Political instability may lengthen the time before large necessary investments in infrastructure can be made. And the main takeaway for me, though, is that the dates aren't in 2300. They are likely a few decades away, perhaps at most a century. This means that leaders in power now have a chance to make some long-run choices that could play out in their lifetimes. But what choices? Let's start with a commitment to preserve the science and leadership art necessary to run the best, highly technical plants in the world. What we'll need are intelligent, experienced, well-prepared technologists and operators who know how to run companies who manufacture physical things. So we'll need to have access to the best technical universities. They'll need high schools and grade schools strong in math and science to feed them talent. And we'll need jobs where Americans can learn how to lead manufacturing operations in practice. So even as individual companies may make the right call in the short run to outsource manufacturing to low-wage countries, our leaders, the leaders of these companies, I think, need to invest in the long term to be ready for when the plants come back. We need to stay involved in how products are manufactured. We can't outsource manufacturing and assume that we never have to understand how it gets done. It's actually a, strategic, it's a prescription for a strategic failure on the part of any company that does it, but I think the long-run choice is especially painful. Um, we need to ensure that some of senior leadership in each such co company has a background in manufacturing. We need to provide opportunities for graduates from the best technical universities in the U.S. to learn and practice. We need to provide financial support to these technical universities, even if some or much of the talent is going overseas to work in plants elsewhere upon graduation. Working within our communities to ensure our local schools do not forget about math and science during the period when jobs requiring them may increasingly be moving overseas is also vital. It's hard to argue that supporting technical universities and basic math and science education is the wrong choice. What makes it tough is that it requires energy, thought, and a long-term commitment of resources. So some long-term decisions are both tough and not clearly right, at least to all observers. For our last example, let's talk about Amazon.com and our approach to resource allocation. Specifically, we'll dive into the financial framework that guides nearly all of our our long-term choices. It's a very simple financial framework, one that Princeton um, ingrained in my brain, uh, starting with Brillian Myers. Has anybody taken a, a corporate finance course? No? Okay. okay. Oh, I know you have, Mark. Thank you. Did you use Brillian Myers? Okay, good. Um, so for our last example, let's talk about Amazon and our approach to resource allocation. Specifically, we'll dive into that financial framework. There's no better artifact to describe our approach to resource allocation then the letter Jeff Bezos, Princeton 86, wrote to our shareholders in 1997. This letter, in fact, was one of the main reasons that I joined the company in 1999. I did not know Jeff when I was at Princeton. Every word of the first two pages matters. So I will, I'll actually read it uh, with you. To our shareholders. Amazon.com, it, it sounds a little crazy, but it actually will give me chills by the second slide. Uh, Amazon.com passed many milestones in 1997. By year-end, we had served more than 1.5 million customers, yielding 838% revenue growth to 147.8 million, and extended our market leadership despite aggressive competitive entry. Most of the analysts think we're going to be near 15 billion this year, just to give you kind of a scale. But this is day one for the Internet, and if we execute well for Amazon.com, 
sorry, if we execute well for Amazon.com. Today, online commerce saves customers money and precious time. Tomorrow, through personalization, online commerce will accelerate the very process of discovery. Amazon.com uses the internet to create real value for its customers, and by doing so, hopes to create an enduring franchise, even in established and large markets. We have a window of opportunity as large players marshal the resources to pursue the online opportunity, and as customers, new to purchasing online, are receptive to forming new relationships. The competitive landscape has continued to evolve at a fast pace. Many large players have moved online with credible offerings and have, develop, and have devoted substantial energy and resources to building awareness, traffic, and sales. I'm probably making this hard for you. Our goal is to move quickly to solidify and extend our current position while we begin to pursue the online commerce opportunities in other areas. We see substantial opportunity in the large markets we are targeting. This strategy is not without risk. It requires serious investment and crisp execution against established franchise leaders. Now, I didn't, I actually went back and read this letter after I had written this talk and realized that I plagiarized. So I, th this, the title of my talk was written in 1997 by my boss, um, but it's all about the long run. That's not me adding. That was in the original 97 letter. We believe that a fundamental measure of our success will be the shareholder value we create over the long term. This value will be a direct result of our ability to extend and solidify our current market leadership position. The stronger our market leadership, the more powerful our economic model. Market leadership can translate directly to higher revenue, higher profitability, greater capital velocity, and correspondingly stronger returns on invested capital. Our decisions have consistently reflected this focus. We first measure ourselves in terms of the metrics most indicative of market leadership, customer and revenue growth, the degree to which our customers continue to purchase from us on a repeat basis, and the strength of our brand. Here's where the chills start for me. Just a second. We have invested and will continue to invest aggressively to expand and leverage our customer base, brand, and infrastructure as we move to establish an enduring franchise. These are the bullets that are, at the time, were, I think, quite gutsy. We will continue to focus relentlessly on our customers. We will continue to make investment decisions in light of long-term market leadership considerations rather than short-term profitability considerations or short-term Wall Street reactions. This is 1997. This is while Jeff still knows that he needs to tap the capital markets to, to get funding. And he's making it crystal clear that we will not make short-term decisions simply to please short-term investors. We will continue to measure our programs and the effectiveness of our investments analytically, to jettison those that do not provide acceptable returns, and to step up our investment in those that work best. We will continue to learn from both our successes and our failures. We will make bold rather than timid investment decisions when we see a su sufficient probability of gaining market leadership advantages. Some of these investments will pay off, others will not, and we will have learned another valuable lesson in either case. When forced to choose between optimizing the appearance of our gap accounting and maximizing the present value of future cash flows, we will take the cash flows, and that has not changed. We will share our strategic thought processes with you, investors, when we make bold choices to the extent competitive pressures allow, so that you can evaluate for yourselves whether we're making rational leadership investments. We will work hard to spend wisely and maintain our lean culture. We understand the importance of continually reinforcing a cost-conscious culture, particularly in a business incurring net losses. We'll balance our focus on growth with emphasis on long-term profitability and capital management. At this stage, we choose to prioritize growth. We choose to prioritize growth because we believe that scale is central to achieving the potential of our business model. We'll continue to focus on hiring and retaining versatile and talented employees and continue to weight their compensation to stock options, now restricted stock, rather than cash. We know our successes will be largely affected by our ability to attract and retain a mo motivated employee base, each of whom must think like and therefore must actually be an owner. So my question is, did anybody at the time read the letter?
If you're uh, Jeff's mother, Jackie, you probably were particularly disturbed by this one. <laughs> that was right before I joined, by the way. <laughs> So was Jeff's focus on the long run the wrong choice? It turns out that the theory behind his 1997 letter has been well understood in the academic world for years. From my Brealey and Myers classic textbook from the 1980s, Principles of Corporate Finance. This is the most important paragraph I think of the book. Notice that it is not correct to say that a share's value is equal to the discounted stream of its future earnings per share. That would recognize the rewards of investment in the form of increased revenue, but not the sacrifice in the form of investment, particularly cash investment. The correct formulation states that share value is equal to the discounted stream of free cash flow per share. Since the phrase discounted cash flow has come up a couple times now, let's take a moment to explain. For all the finance folks in the room, uh, forgive me this brief diversion. Let's ask a simple question. How much would you be willing to pay today for a certain promise to pay you back one dollar one year from now? If the annual interest rate you could earn on your money is R, then you should be indifferent between one dollar today and one plus R dollars promised to you in one year. This is because you could just put the dollar in a bank, receive exactly one plus R dollar in the future. If you divide both of these by one plus R, it follows that a pledge to receive one dollar one year from now is worth one over one plus R dollars today. This approach can be extended to year two where you would simply compound the, the equivalent interest and say that you'd be willing to pay one over one plus R squared, quantity squared, today for the promise of a dollar two years from now. If we take the cash that's left over after we've made all of our investments, we have what accountants call free cash flow for each year. Discounting in the manner, manner we just discussed, each future year's expected free cash flow, and summing them over all future years, gives us the best indication of the present value of the firm. This approach has been around a long time, and most academics like Brealey and Myers agree this is the best way to value a firm. However, the concept can seem more complicated than accounting net income. You can see from all of the pundits who were looking at our results in 1997, not clear to everyone. Ken Scarbeck, who's an Indianapolis investor, highlights this problem. He says companies report their earnings as net income, a figure calculated according to generally accepted accounting principles, but that number often provides the investor with a distorted picture of what really took place. Net income includes various non-cash items that obscure the actual cash flows within the company. Another group says free cash flow is a much better measure of financial health than net income because it accurately reflects the ability to pay dividends or expand income production. Maximizing discounted cash flow is not a new con concept. This approach to valuing investments, as far as I can tell, hence firms, dates back at least to Arthur Mellon Wellington's The Economic Theory of the Location of Railways, written in 1877. He wrote this quote, another question as to which the locating engineer, he's biased here toward the engineer and not toward the corporate monkey mucks, as you'll see, should have some definite ideas, if only to check the vague visions of this board of directors, is as to the probable growth of traffic in the future and the justifiable present expenditure to provide therefore. Amazon has rarely wavered from the position articulated by Jeff Bezos in 1997. 
Our interest in making good long-term choices has become a cultural paradigm for us. Because so much of our compensation of our managers depends on our stock price, we certainly worry about its level and its trajectory of growth. But we are not obsessed with it. And we don't panic when our volatile short-term income drives stock price volatility. We have myriad examples of decisions we've made that were not optimal in the short run, but have proven to be wise in either delivering long-term value or preserving important strategic options for us. Let's take a look at just a few examples. First, the decision to offer customer reviews, even if they are negative about a product. This may seem obvious now. When we first started adding reviews to the website, all manner of stakeholders, including publishers, financial analysts, and the business press tried to help us. They noted that perhaps we didn't understand our business, that the goal was to sell things, not dissuade customers from buying them. Jeff disagreed. He believed that customers would be better off if we let the community share honest information about each product on our site. He knew that finding and discovering things you want to buy depend critically on trusting the sources of information that guide purchasing decisions. Based on our customer trust scores and the ongoing popularity of customer reviews, this was the right call. In 1998, our company barely had the logistics and warehousing capacity to meet demand during the critical holiday season. This experience convinced Jeff that he needed to invest enough capital to ensure logistics was not a bottleneck. I joined the company in September of 1999 and helped us complete spending over $300 million of the 470 on the balance sheet to build out our physical infrastructure. Did we overspend a bit? In retrospect, certainly. But with the help of this huge surge of investment and energy, coupled with some of the same process improvement techniques that have helped manufacturing companies for decades. We've stayed ahead of demand while dramatically lowering costs and improving quality for the last eight years. The drain on our financial performance in the years immediately following this investment were huge. Our stocks suffered as a result, but we would not be able to service nearly $15 billion in demand this year had we not made these investments. We would have capped the long-term market value of our company. We didn't. Prior to 1998, Amazon.com sold itself as Earth's biggest bookstore. I remember hearing a radio ad about all the books fitting into giant stadium effect. Uh, we were growing by several hundred percent each year, and there didn't seem to many outside observers to be any reason to expand into any other categories. Jeff and the management team realized that our young brand was still pliable enough to be expanded to mean great customer-centric experience beyond books, but that this elasticity might not last forever. Over the course of four years, we launched businesses in music, video, software, video games, toys, electronics, kitchen, among others. These new businesses required investments in inventory and lots of software development, website changes, and business thought. At first, the market applauded our new launches, but as it became clear that the investment dollars would precede returns by several years, in the best case, it became very impatient with us. I wouldn't have the portfolio of successful stores I now run if we had shared this impatience. Another decision deemed crazy by some was to let other sellers sell in our product detail pages. Why would you invite competitors to sell directly against you on your store, we were asked. The simple answer was that these sellers would add selection to our categories faster than we might ourselves, and that customers would love it. In fact, we were able to structure the economics so that we became indifferent between an item sold by a merchant on our site and by one sold by our own retail business. Chalk up another one for the long run. We're currently in the middle of the long-run long choice that hasn't clearly turned the corner. This is our strategy of adding enormous selection, even when inventory turns go down for a couple of years. If we own physical stores, we know that carrying the very deep tail, say the two millionth most popular item in every store would be too expensive. Humans simply aren't patient enough to walk around a store with two million things in. With our direct-to-consumer model, though, we only have to have one somewhere in the country to be in stock. So the investment is much smaller, especially since we don't need to scale this investment as the company grows from $15 billion to whatever it ultimately becomes. We believe that our ability to get every item, every item that's uniquely identifiable, even obscure ones, on their way to customers in a matter of hours is a huge competitive advantage. And we're willing to make the investment as customers so far seem to agree. Another example of long-run discounted cash flow-based choices for us is our shift to everyday low pricing. For a brief period early in this decade, we experimented with higher prices. We discovered a startling truth. Customers prefer low prices. <laughs> we haven't looked back, even when the compression on our gross margins has caused short-term oriented analysts to criticize our results. They've criticized our results, our management, and our stock. We've certainly done the math, and we're confident that we can get our cost structure to the place where our return on invested capital is in the triple digits. So why wait to lower prices to consumers? 
Our decision to offer everyday super saver shipping was an easy one once we had made the, the everyday low price decision. We knew that shipping charges were a major impediment to buying online and to increasing the share of wallet that people were spending across online and offline. And we had achieved the cost structure to make free shipping more like a marketing expense than a boat anchor. That decision was an easy one. Sometimes we've had to wait to prove to ourselves that we could deliver a superb customer experience with a new idea before we launch it. In the case of Amazon Prime, do we have any Prime members in the audience? Thank you very much. This is a subscription service. It's all you can eat. Two-day shipping. You pay $79 once per year. This is a sales talk. Um, and everything that you buy for the rest of the year ships for free in two days. Um, we spent nearly three years building the logistics infrastructure to ensure we could ship any of the over one million, now nearly two million unique items in our warehouse in time to get to the U.S. customer in two days and at a cost that would make long-term sense. When we had proven to ourselves that we could consistently meet these objectives, we launched Amazon Prime. It's been a very expensive program and the financial community has expressed lots of doubt over its viability. What we know is that it has increased nicely our share of wallet for each Prime customer and has also encouraged them to shop more broadly, much more broadly across categories. As we enroll more and more Prime members who were less frequent buyers before they entered the program, the program becomes, more, becomes increasingly valuable to us. This one has required a very large investment of time and money and has been all about the long run. The very last example I'll share is our decision three years ago to begin adding more software engineers to build a true service-oriented service architecture. We had been working on our code base for long enough to know that it could limit our ability to grow if we didn't do things like encapsulate data within services and create true hardened application program interfaces between them. But we went well beyond simply refactoring our code to building externally available web services for everything from massive data storage to elastic compute clouds. We were talking about this earlier. We're currently delivering web scale computing with over 220,000 registered developers, 10 different fundamental web services, including storage, computing, and others. It turns out that the external development community has forced us to get better even faster than our internal customers of information technology. I guess that's in part because the market has no personal relationship with us. Um, it doesn't care if we're working hard. It only cares if it works. Our services either work fast in a high quality, reliable way or they don't. If they don't, customers go elsewhere while internal customers are captive. Is our web services program expensive? You bet. Is it worth it? We'll see. So far, our results for free cash flow generation have been much more volatile than those for net income and we're very proud of that. If you look at our results, you see that in much less volatile, sorry, and we're very proud of that. You see that in 1998, we did generate slightly positive free cash flow, but we then embarked on three years of huge investment in the long run. We built out our in distribution infrastructure, we invested in new categories, we developed new software platforms. In 2002, three, and four, we took a bit of a breather on our investments as we worked to make sure that the cash we invested in 1999 and 2000 was paying off. We have just spent two more years investing heavily again for the long run. I can't wait to find out if we were right. So short run and long run choices are clearly related as the sum of thousands of short term decisions can determine vastly different long term outcomes. This is true for both resource allocation and the consistency of it, the two classes. But the long run is more than just this sum. I think leaders have the obligation to imagine the future and to make choices that are consistent with what they see. For many leaders, for our company, it's still day one. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Um, why is it Amazon doing like Dell, requiring all its vendors to keep all the inventory? Uh, now, I don't know if Dell has a lot of future. They may have maximized, squeezed all the fat out of their system at this point and all the market share they can squeeze out, but, and they may not be on day one. But um, they seem to, to get Intel and everybody else to do all the inventory and, and all the capitalization for themselves. So there are a couple of pieces. First, um, first is that I, I believe that if there isn't a fundamental change in the supply chain that accompanies that, it's simply a financial move. So we could, ob we could obviously work toward consignment. People give us inventory that we hold in our own warehouses. If we don't want the capital expense of building warehouses, we could ask them to build them right next to us. But if something doesn't change in the total amount of inventory in the supply chain, in the long run, the value isn't going to, we have a limited pie. 
and the value is not going to grow for all the participants. So the, the first thing I want to see us do is actually reduce cycle times, reduce variation in lead times so that everybody can win. Our, our vendors can continue to be profitable and we can get much of the value that accrues from those improvements. That's the first piece. The second piece is that it turns out that the number of SKUs required to build a PC is vastly smaller than the number of SKUs that we want to hold in our warehouses. We, we basically want to have one, at least one of every item that's manufactured uh, that has some unique identifier on it, which you know, puts you in the order of the 10, 10 millions. Um, in order to do that efficiently, you really can't be in a position where you've got every single vendor, which would now number in the hundreds of thousands, with trucks lined up around your factory waiting to deliver just in time. The third piece is that we, to prime customers in particular, want to offer a cycle time that's now down to about four hours between the time that you click and the time that we can put it on the truck out the door. And we don't have to do four hours all the time because the postal sorts only run at night. So if you order in the morning, we have more than four hours. But the fact that we can do one of millions of items from anywhere in the warehouse in that kind of time uh, is not something I would trust to outsource. And the value I think we've created in terms of customer trust because we actually had that kind of short cycle time and very reliable delivery more than outweighs the impact to our capital structure of having both the inventory and the fiscal warehouses. So that would be my three, three points I think about that. Other questions? Hi, Chris. Dr. Flutis uh, uh, taught me um, uh, what little I know about uh, OR technology and uh, We've been fortunate to hire some, some folks uh, like Russ Algor, who was a, ultimately an MIT PhD, but became a PhD because of Professor Flutus' influence, I think. And um, we spent a lot of time building very important mathematical models that drive a lot of our software. Um, so th thanks for, for what you taught us. Jeff, you've, uh, you've obviously started with books and have moved into just about anything. I think when I go to buy something on the site, you know, I just or thinking of buying something, whether it's a camera or whatever, I'll just you know go Thank look you. on Amazon first and look, read the reviews. But what other stuff you talked before the talk started about some areas that you're getting into that I wasn't aware of, and can you talk about some of the other new categories you're getting into? Well, in terms of categories, I mean, essentially everything that again that's manufactured, with probably the exception of I don't think we'll do tobacco or firearms is just a choice that we'd make. Um, and it's unlikely that we'll have automobiles in our warehouses. Um, I have, you know, we have 10 million square feet, I think, but um, we need more if we're going to do automobiles. Uh, but pretty much everything else. So books, music, video, software, video games, electronics, kitchen, apparel, shoes. By the way, if you, if you buy shoes online, please look up endless.com. That's us. Um, it's something we launched that, that's actually done quite well recently. Um, we actually have a burn-on-demand DVD and CD site, which is great for independent film producers right now who are struggling to get Hollywood to pay attention. We have a print-on-demand uh, publishing uh, house that actually will, will print one at a time uh, in an efficient way, which is great for authors, again, who are struggling to get noticed in New York. Um, so a bunch of those businesses. We also, so those are the consumer-facing businesses. We have a software business, the, the one I talked about with the Elastic Compute Clouds and the Simplified Storage Service. And then we have a merchant business where we sell our software and our store to other merchants who want to sell you know, in our store. Uh, so there's kind of three different customer sets, developers, uh, merchants, and our consumers. I'm very heavily focused on and biased toward the consumer business. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that before the process of your talk was that uh, you're focused on the long run. But given that um, a typical investor has you know, a lot of options that would give pretty high returns in a very short run, how do you sustain you know, shareholder confidence over the term you know, while you have your negative um, cash, discounted yeah. cash flows? How, how do you sustain the interest and how do you survive? How have you done so and why haven't the shareholders bailed out when they were much more? You know, well, one money? of the things I've watched Jeff do, and, and over the last few years, I, I've done a lot of the investor relations work, um, so I can, I can personally validate this, but um, Jeff is very clear with investors, we all have been, that if your interest is a short flip, don't invest with us. I mean, one of, one of the problems people have when they go to the capital markets is they want to they don't want to turn anybody away because it's a potential investor. Our approach from the beginning has been, look, if you're, if you're in this for a short win, we would likely to disappoint you, so don't, don't come with us. So that means in the long run, if you, if you read our, our queue, 
you're going to find that the second largest investor after Jeff Bezos is uh, Lake Mason, Bill Miller. Uh, Bill Miller, as some of you know, probably recently his streak, I think he had 14 or 15 years of beating the S&P 500, recently came to an end. But, uh, but Bill, Bill has been an incredibly long-term investor. He's been with us for six or seven years. Um, and uh, he's one of those people who says, you know what, I look at this kind of cash flow only. He was one of those people in 2000 when everybody was predicting we were going to run out of cash that looked at the math and said, this is crazy, this company is undervalued, invested heavily in us, and, and he did very well as a result of it. So we have attracted long-term investors because I think we've been very transparent on how we will operate. And people who also studied corporate finance from, you know, and knew Breedley and Myers and know that discounted cash flow is a much better way to measure than gap income um, have followed us. So, so some of it sort of sold itself. Most of it was, was standing tall and sticking to what you believe in, even when people are hammering you, as you saw those quotes from the late 90s. Thank you for uh, coming.